going to pick up our study. We're almost finished the book of Revelation. We don't go through this book often, but every time it's been a blessing, and I've learned more as I go through it each time. Um, now with the aid of the PowerPoint presentation and something visual to go along with it, uh, we are, if you look at this chart, I can just kind of turn around here. Now we are in this study here at this time. We're in that, the last panel there of our chart. And uh, this, tonight's lesson, and then one more lesson to try to close it up and complete our study on the book of Revelation. Uh, we have used images, pictures, and different things that I've kind of found online. But one of the things I find uh, is... The scripture says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared uh, for his people. And he has revealed uh, things to us by his spirit, which we have in his word. But as I've said before, the reality when we see it, what we imagine, what we think, doesn't come close the pictures that I use, in many ways, they are they're not accurate. Uh, I we're, we're describing things and and illustrating things that no one has really seen, and uh, so keep that in mind that uh, some of the pictures we we use. I don't, uh, it's not going to be exact, but uh, we're going to be looking here, the New Jerusalem described in detail. We've, we finished the chronology, basically. Now, as a final uh, part of this, he goes into detail describing the New Jerusalem. Uh, we'll be looking here at Revelation chapter 21, um, verse 9 through chapter 22, verse 5. Uh, will be the portion of Scripture that we are going to be covering this evening, trying to. Um, the physical description of the city. As you see, the one image there of this city coming down uh, from God, uh, and I don't know if you can see on here, there's kind of a base around it, and there are these are the gates of pearl, uh, shown there, we will mention that in more detail. Uh, here's another picture of the city as it lies four square and what we're going to be looking at is the wall the gates the foundations the city the streets uh, of this uh, city revelation chapter uh, 21 verse 9 and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. As we get to discussing these different things, keep in mind that the city, the New Jerusalem, this is the bride, the Lamb's wife. And we've pointed out that the bride, the Lamb's wife, is not all of the saved. But it is a select number out of the saved that are found worthy to walk with him in white, to be his bride. And so keep that in mind as well. Um, as those one, we think those, those seven angels, the seven last plagues, and how nasty they those plagues were. But these angels are 
pretty nice people. I mean, after this is over, this one angel comes up to John and says, here, come here, I want to show you something. <laughs> and so, it's not quite that nonchalant, but here's one of, the, one of those seven angels. He says, come hither. And said, I'll show thee the bride. So that which follows is the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This goes back to uh, chapter 21, uh, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so, the wall, um, said, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And had a wall, great and high. And I kind of clo closed up on that one picture. I had a wall, great and high, verse 12. Um, and it had 12 gates, verses 12 through 13. We'll come back to those in a moment. Uh, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Come back to that in a moment. That's verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Um, and the angel had a golden reed to measure the city. Now, the reed is not just talking about some little flimsy bamboo or something, but it was actually a measuring stick that was used. And it was golden, and it was a golden measuring stick to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof, verse 15. The measure of the wall was 144 cubits, which I understand is approximately 216 feet. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's the height of the wall, or the thickness of the wall. It doesn't it just says the the, the measure of the wall? Uh, approximately 216 feet. And matter of fact, and it's and he goes on to say there, um, the cubit according to the measure of a man. Now go back, I remember a cubit was like from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger of an average man. And he says, and this was the measure of the angel. In other words, the angel was about the same size as a man. Now sometimes people picture, the, and there's different classes of angels. Right now we're not going to study on angels. But uh, some people believe that some angels are bigger than others. Well, this one was the size of a man because a cubit by the measure of the angel is the same as a cubit by the measure of a man. Um, the building of the wall was of jasper, verse 11, having the uh, glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, I, I got on the internet and looked up a jasper stone, and most of them were not clear. They were brown or tan. And, and there's a lot of different jasper stones. They come in different colors. Um, but uh, this one says the light, and I, I, can, uh, I imagine like a diamond, a clear as crystal, but he said the light of the city was this clear, bright light. Verse 18, and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. We'll come back to that. But there is a sample I found of a clear jasper stone. So, um, now again, 
The Bible uses these descriptions, and many times we find that the terminology used here does not match the terminology we use today. Uh, usage of words change. Uh, and cultures change and times change. And so, as we look at these, these things and we look at some of these stones and, and all, uh, but here is a piece of jasper stone clear as crystal. Then, let's go back and look at the gates. It mentioned that the wall had 12 gates. Uh, verse 12, the wall uh, had a great wall and high and had 12 gates. And at the gate, there were 12 angels. Now we had this big host of angels. And um, they're going to be busy too. They have things to do. We see 12 of them here uh, designated. And I don't know if they work in shifts. Uh, what, but there's always an angel at the, each of these 12 gates. Uh, and the names were written on these gates. And they are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, probably, instead of going back to, to Genesis or Exodus to find the names of the tribes of the children of Israel, this is probably going to be consistent with the tribes listed in Revelation chapter 7. Um, and I heard the number of them, talking about the 144,000, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Asher, the tribe of Naphtali, uh, the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Issachar, the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Joseph, and the tribe of Benjamin. Now those are the tribes listed. In the book of Exodus, when it listed, the tribe of Levi was not counted. And Joseph's two sons were counted in his stead. And so, uh, not, there, there's 12 tribes mentioned here. And I believe these will be the 12 tribes whose names are written over the gates of the city of New Jerusalem. One of these is the tribe of Levi. In the Old Testament pattern, which I believe there, there's a strong correlation here because as we go on to see them, so on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, speaks of the, the pattern that we found in the book of Exodus, the way the tribes were uh, encamped and placed around the tabernacle, the tabernacle being in the center, facing east, and the, the tribes were arranged, three tribes on each side around it. But within that, or immediately around the tabernacle, was the tribe of Levi because they were the priest and they ministered about uh, the things of God in the tabernacle. But now we see it changing up a little bit where one of these three tribes is the tribe of Levi. And so as the, the city comes down, as we imagine it, as we see it above the earth, the children of Israel uh, their place is going to be a, a, around the base, I believe, of this city, arranged in this way. But the city is the bride of Christ. This is the bride of the Lamb. This is His church. They are minister, if you will, of that true tabernacle or of the 
uh, his church um, and the ministry that uh, we see there. So it's a little bit different. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls. So the pictures, you know, and we'll we'll kind of come back to a thought on that. Um, And we see foundations of the wall. Um, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. said, Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed, uh, fit, yeah, fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And so we see in the letter to the church at Ephesus a, a illustration and an application, an idea of as a church, as a local church, they are like a temple, and the foundation being the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so I think we see a fulfillment, a uh, future fulfillment in that. There was, is the present fulfillment that each church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're built it together as living stones, fitly framed together, that we grow up in the Lord uh, as a holy temple and habitation of God through the Spirit. Now we see a more literal, physical fulfillment here in the New Jerusalem. Uh, so the 12 foundations in each of them is the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now I'm not going to speculate on whether Matthias or Paul is in that, <laughs> that number. Uh, I, I feel pretty confident that Judas Iscariot is not. But uh, apart from that, I'm not going to speculate any further. Uh, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Now there's just a few. I, again, I looked online and found all kinds of pictures. And, and when I think of precious stones, I think of something more clear like these. But some of them they had almost looked like polished stones. Uh, and, and these are of great value too in, in different ones. But this is just uh, to spark your imagination, if you will, because it says it's garnished with. Now, some have tried to think, you know, each foundation is like this one big, huge, flat stone or something, but it says the foundations were garnished. Now, I, I'm not a cook, but I've been around kitchens because I like to eat. And usually when you talk about garnishing something, you put something, that's more for a presentation to make it look pretty. And so it says the foundations were garnished with all manner of precious stones. But it goes on to talk about each foundation, each of the 12 foundations had a particular stone identified with it. Uh, and so we see here the, the first was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third uh, Chalcedony, fourth Emerald, 
fifth Sardonyx, sixth Sardius, seventh Chrysolite, eighth Beryl, ninth Topaz, tenth Chrysoprasius, eleventh Janssen, and twelfth Amethyst. And some of those I can pronounce, some of them I'm familiar with, such as Sapphire, Emerald, uh, topaz, amethyst, um, but these are the twelve manner of precious stones uh, that garnish the twelve foundations of the city, of the wall. And now the city said so the city lie for square. And it goes on to uh, say basically that the length, the breadth, the height is the same. Uh, the length, breadth, the height is the same. It's a cube. Uh, 12,000 furlongs. Now I've seen some different figures. I had figured it's about 1,400 miles. I've seen in some other calculations where they said it was 1,500 miles, depending on how long a furlong. <clears throat> but I figured that it's approximately the distance from Detroit to Miami. Um, if you can see here on, on this map, from Detroit to Miami, according to the Atlas is 1,385 miles in a straight line. As the crow flies, well, that'd be one tired crow by the time he got there. Um, so this city said it's pure gold, clear as glass. So now that's about in proportion to you know. That I've seen some different maps and they've got a square drawn on there as to how much territory would cover and everything. But it is huge. Um, this New Jerusalem. And it is said it's four square. It is a cube. It is 1,400 miles in each direction. And um, but Henry Morris once time in a book, Biblical Cosmology, had done some figuring. And he does a lot of conservative estimates and assumptions. But based on that, if 10% of the number of the people that have ever lived are actually saved. Now, and he going at this from the standpoint everybody that's saved is going to live in this city, which they're not. But his calculations is based on everybody's saved. So if 10% of the population of the world that has ever lived are actually saved. And Giving a city that you have some areas that's given over to public areas, parks, palace, whatever. Every individual would still have an area allotted to them of something like 200 cubic acres per individual. So, there's going to be a lot of room in this city. Now that's based on his... And he says, it's pure gold, clear as glass. We'll come back to that as well. Now the streets... Um, the city and the streets of the city are made of pure gold. And so now there we see some gold cobblestone there. Gold bricks. The yellow brick road. Uh, but when we think of gold, this is kind of what we think. But it, it says, no, it's so pure as to be clear 
like glass. And so there's kind of like a, another precious gemstone with the gold showing through it. But it says, this isn't something solid that you can't see through. This is something that is so pure, so a gold so pure, so different that it is clear like glass. Well, as you imagine, and we will come to this uh, in another point. Here's the point I wanted to make. Talk about the, the gates of pearl, the streets of gold. Many of the mental images we have of heaven are actually the descriptions of the new Jerusalem in the new heavens and new earth. Uh, we, we've been taught, whether you were a Catholic or not, you have been taught because it's permeated our thinking, our culture. Talk about the pearly gates. When you die, you go to heaven, and you come to the pearly gates, and there's St. Peter standing at the pearly gates. Because he's got the keys. <laughs> yeah. Now that's Catholic error, falsehood, heresy, as a false picture. No one, when you... When you, if you're saved, you die, you immediately go to heaven. You don't have to stop at any gate and get permission to enter in. You've already been accepted in the Beloved. And where He is, that's where we're going to be. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. But this imagery that we have, and we associate with heaven. When we die and go to heaven, we're going to see... Uh, pearly gates, we're going to have streets of gold. No, that's not heaven. Well, you may see that because this comes down from God out of heaven. It's there in heaven. But uh, this is actually the descriptions of the New Jerusalem. Uh, and then he kind of summarizes here some things, uh, the glory of the city. He says, I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Our concept of a temple or a house of worship, something to house God. As the tabernacle, the temple, and the Shekinah glory took up its abode, or even the church now in habitation of God through the Spirit. There's no temple there. There is no need of a temple there. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Their presence, that's, that's the whole idea of the temple. Here is the presence of God. Well, we're going to be in His very presence. See, and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And part of the purpose, I think, of this city, the new, there's a new heavens and a new earth, but in this new heavens, it says there's no sun, there's no moon. Because the glory of God that is dwelling within this city is going to radiate out through this city. A light, it says, a, a, the light is like that of uh, a jasper stone, clear. So this clear light is going to radiate out of this city. That's the reason there's so many of these pictures. You see, you know, they try to depict buildings as though they're made of solid gold. But you can't see through them. And uh, that's where I say some of the, these pictures and all, they come short, they fall short. Uh, some of the pictures that we use to hear, it, it looks like the light is shining down on top of this city, so there's a sun up there. So uh, it's, there is no sun. Jesus Christ and God the Father are the light of it. And this is their permanent dwelling is in this city. And their glory radiates out through this city. 
Let me see. It said, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Now here again, here's the city, the new Jerusalem. The nations of the saved shall walk in the light of this city. Now if all the saved are in the city, you don't need an earth for them to live on. That'd be a little, not just redundant, but uh, useless because everybody's there in the city. You wouldn't need a new earth. So the nations of the saved are upon this new earth. Again, a lot of the pictures I saw, they took maps and, uh, of Israel, the Middle East, and you put a big square over it about where, how much area this city would cover. But it's going to be a totally different typography and geography of this new earth. It's not going to have all the oceans and seas and things that we have now. It's going to be different. There's not going to be a Palestine. It doesn't exist anymore. The United States of America doesn't exist anymore. If you kind of get your mind around this, the, the geography of the new earth is totally different. Now, the nations of the saved, you've got people saved out of every nation, kindred, tongue, tribe, family. It speaks of there in Revelation. And so people have been saved out of these various nations and national boundaries have changed over the course of time from you know, one century to the next. Uh, what constituted France in the 1500s is different than what constituted the area that was known as Gaul in the four and five hundreds, you see. These things have changed, but people that have been saved out of all these places through time are going to dwell upon this new earth. And it speaks of them as nations. Again, our glorified bodies, things are going to be different how we're going to be classified into nations, I don't know. Uh, whether it's based on the nations and families and tribes that we were made up when we were saved, when we lived here upon the earth. I don't know, but it says, The nations of, the, of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, of that city. But again, the city is the bride, the Lamb's wife. And the kings of the earth, there's going to be kings. And not everybody's going to be a king. So we're all going to rule and reign with him. And part of that is through the millennial kingdom. But Paul describes in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the resurrection, our glorified bodies. And he says, you know, there's, there's a natural body and then there's the glorified body. They're different. He said there's one glory of the sun and there's another glory of the moon and there's another glory of the stars and each of the stars differs one from another in glory. He said such is the resurrection. Our position in the new heaven and new earth will be determined, I believe, by our service and work that we have rendered to the Lord in this life. We are not saved by our works, but our reward is based on our work and service. And so, the kings, some people will be rated kings, others princes, princesses, I don't know. will bring their glory and honor into it as 
the gates, not just the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, but then all the other tribes of the, the earth will be there. And there shall be no night there. We're talking about saying the gates will not be shut at all at day, and there will be no night. So those gates remain open all the time. And since there is no night, it's one eternal day. Now there are some things that indicate a measuring of time, but there, since there's no night, it's not time that is marked uh, night and day, you know, this day, that day, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, uh, for there shall be no night there, verse 25. And then verse 27, he talks about there's nothing that defiles is going to enter in. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And this goes back to the previous chapters, and talking about the first resurrection and the second death and that final judgment and whosoever name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, this is, again, this is a summary now. And there, in this new heavens, new earth, there's nothing sinful, there's nothing wicked, there's nothing that defiles that is present anywhere in this new creation. And it begins in chapter 22. It, chapter break, but it doesn't... This is a continuation of the description of the city. So there's a river of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now here's another picture. That's... Doesn't, uh, I see there's a waterfall way back here in the, the distance. It looks like coming out. Here's the city. Here's a waterfall coming down in this river running there on the new earth and rocks and trees and all. You know, they're trying to make it look beautiful. And it is. I think it's going to be more beautiful than any man can imagine and capture in, you know, on some kind of a, a painting or whatever. So we see Revelation 21.1 And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Clear as crystal. And not going to be any polluted water there. Because nothing in or in that defiles. So the, the, the water is pure. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And we sing talking about flows by the throne of God. No, it doesn't flow by it. It flows out from it. That's the origin of it, in other words. The very source and origin of the river of water of life is God. And in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now remember back in the... Um, book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden we mentioned the tree of life. And when man had sinned, he was barred access to the tree of life. Lest he eat of it and be forever in that sinful condition. God had plans of redemption. Now we see here that brought full circle then, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now again, here's a picture that I, to me, this, it, they've got a whole bunch of trees lining on either side. They said this in the midst of the river and on either side of it. So I, I was kind of envisioning a, a 
roots coming up from the middle of the river and from each bank coming up into one big trunk and spreading out over the whole thing. I don't know. But here's a picture. It's a pretty picture. Um, and it describes this tree so it bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. Well, now here is marking time somehow. You have one eternal day, but you've got 12 months. That's something for the theologians to <laughs> wrestle with. Um, maybe Newton was right when his, his song, uh, Amazing Grace, but we've been there 10,000 years, right, shining as the sun. Well, if it's one eternal day, how do you how do you have years? You know, that's a, a, a concept we have now in time, but we're going to be in eternity. Well, it talks about this tree bearing twelve manner of fruit. You know, yield of fruit every month. So there again, uh, marking uh, some passage of time in some way. Twelve manner of fruit. What, assuming it sounds like that each month it has, you know, this is the fruit of the month. And next month it's going to change. There's going this one tree, but yeah. tree of life, very special tree. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Well, if we're in eternity, these people are all saved. Why do you need healing? The word there in the Greek has the idea of life. It's a tree of life. The leaves are for the life. And I was thinking, and what's watering this tree? You know, the fruit and the leaves and everything draws its nourishment up from the roots, from the water. It's being watered by the river water of life. And so, it's for the life of the nations. Nations of the saved that walk in. Now there's no more curse. Here's a, the summary then as we uh, draw to the uh, conclusion here. There's no more curse. Verse 3. There shall be no more curse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Just reading a portion of that which was pronounced upon Adam as our federal head. In Adam, all mankind fell, and this curse is pronounced upon him and upon his posterity. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Notice I'm reading that in the sweat of your face, and I'm sitting up here sweating and wiping the sweat off my brow. Uh, it's just a reminder of that curse. But that curse is going to be, I'm not going to get too hot. I'm not going to overheat. I'm going to have a glorified body. I'm going to have a perfect thermostat. But beyond that, I'm going to have a perfect surroundings and environment. The temperatures, it's, it's, it's not going to get too hot. It's not going to get too cold. I don't think we'll have snow and blizzards and things like that. Um, all these people are going to have to leave their snowmobiles behind when they go to heaven. And they're not going to need them there. Um, 
but we said no more curse. He said, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. We talk about serving the Lord. We will serve him perfectly in that day. Now what that's going to consist of, I don't know. But we're going to serve him. There's going to be fellowship. There's going to be communion. And it's going to be perfect. It is that for which man was originally created by God to be to him. One with whom he can commune and have fellowship with. And that will be fulfilled. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. You know, in the letters to the seven churches, he's talking about a new name given and so on and so forth. He said, we shall see his face. Now, part of the significance of that is he said, no man has seen God at any time. God is spirit. But not only that, but our God is a consuming fire. Because of sin, because we're in the flesh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We could not stand in His presence because of the fleshly body after the fall. See, Adam, before the fall, God came down, they walked together, talked together. Adam could see God. But after the fall, he hid himself. And rightly so, because man now could not stand in the presence of God, could not see God, could not look upon God. The, the glory of God would consume man where he stands. But now that's what have been done away with. We have a glorified body. And, and part of the purpose is so we can see God. And we can stand and look at Him face to face and speak to Him face to face and He can speak to us. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of sun. The Lord God giveth them light. And more ways than just the physical light that we need to see by, but that perfect light, understanding, knowledge, everything that light has come to be associated with, He gives us light. What a, what a wonderful thought there. And they shall reign forever. They, sh they that the same. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Bride, the nations of the saved, they shall reign forever and ever. This brings to fulfillment and conclusion God's promises, His purpose. Our potential. Everything that we lost in the fall when Adam fell, we've gained back and so much more. This new heavens and earth and the new Jerusalem is so beyond what Adam had in the garden. People think in terms of, I like, go back and have those conditions like it was in the garden. We're going to have even better conditions than what Adam enjoyed in the garden. The 
that curse has been totally lifted. And they shall reign forever and ever. We will stop there.